We'll, we'll see if this works. It allows me to walk around. Is, it, is this working? Can you pick me yeah. up? Okay. I've never done this before. I, I've gone to theater and I see those. It's really impressive. It makes me feel better if, uh, if nothing else. Okay, my talk deals with global change in the vulnerability of chaparral to acute drought or chronic drought. Thank you, Aaron, for introducing this concept. Isn't that great how he did that? So on the left is acute drought, and what happens is this uh, picture was taken in the wettest month of the year, February in 2014, and we see death. But the reason these chaparral shrubs died was due to a very deep, acute, short drought period. Here we have Cianotha species, and uh, they're shallow rooted, they don't sprout after fire, and as a result, if there's an acute drought, they die in massive quantities. This plant over here is the opposite. It is very deep rooted. It goes down to over 40 feet in depth. And so it doesn't die with acute drought. But if you have a drought from 2012 to 2016, that's classified as chronic. And what can happen in that plant is that the root is still alive down there, but on the water is depleting all the carbon. So if there's a normal fungus that lives with the plant, it can get out of control because the plant normally supplies carbon to surround, surround the infection. You see this right here? That's called a canker. That's a fungal infection, but it's a normal fungus. The plant handles it, no problem. And it will wall off the fungus and control it. Number two, it has to have a high water status to transport the carbon there to wall off the fungus. Now, if you worry about this, uh, escaping infection here, no problem. This past year, wildfire, it's been sterilized. <laughs> That's the canker right there, okay? And this plant is called Molophyll Rhinum Coral Cinematic. It is the co dominant on our campus, and uh, we're only talking about the Santa Monica Mountains. And uh, the co dominance is this one here, this is seen on this main carpus, and this one is seen on this. So, Talk about the fungus, how the chronic drought can cause that plant to die if the fungal infection gets carried away and blocks off water supply. In this case, right here, this is a shallow root shrub, and it will do what Aaron described. If it's really dry, acute drought, it will lose water faster than the water can be supplied by the stem. And if that tension is negative enough, it's going to suck an air bubble. That's called an embolism. That's called cavitation, and you don't want an air bubble in your xylem conduits or pipes because it blocks the water flow and that plant will die. And you see evidence of it right here, and we have data to show that that will happen. Okay, so that's the introduction. This is what uh, our campus looks like, uh, what it should look like. Here's the Pacific Ocean, Point Dune. Here's Melasma Lorina. Here's the scene of the spinosis. They're seeing off this make carpus. They're all co dominance They overlap. They're all about the same height, about three meters. But do their roots penetrate the same depth? The answer is no. This one only goes down five or six feet because it's a non-sprouter after fire. It's just as old as the last fire. And in this case, when I came in 1974, the fires came every 12 years. Average for the Santa Monica is 32 years. Pepperdine every 12 years. Guess what it is today? Every seven years, fire frequency is going up. This one here is a champion of re-sprout success. So it's 40 feet deep roots. It will sprout 100% after fire, and 99% will survive for at least 30 years. We have data on that. So the point is, these species are not all alike. Chaparral have to be examined relative to their life history traits, and even though they're dominant. So if you look at the water status of these plants right here, it looks like this. Did I label my graph? Is that okay? <laughs> so here's my scale. It's a scale of zero down to negative eight. This means fully hydrated, pure water. This is incredibly dry. And you know how dry that is? Your crop plant will wilt right there and your crop plant will die right there. That's how dry the Cianotus megacarpus is. But notice Melasma rhina, it never goes below two. So here we are, May, June, July, August, September, 
It hasn't rained for six to eight months. This is what happens to our chaparral. But typically, they're adapted to that. So we can do a vulnerability curve, just like Aaron did a vulnerability curve. And you see, here's my scale. I got the same scale here, right, Aaron? I did it right. Here's two. Here's our scale, zero. I'm going to have to go way down past negative 10, negative 12, negative 14. There's our negative sign. In order to capture how resistant this being off this megacarpus is to dehydration. How about melasma lorana right here? It's not very resistant. It loses all of its hydraulic conductivity around negative four. So negative four, this one's dead. This one can go down past negative 12 to negative 13. So if you see this, loss of conductivity, no blockage, no embolism. Here, 100% occlusion. If you're a plant, you do not want 100% occlusion. What that means is no water is getting from the soil for the leaves. This plant. So you can see the example here. Um, this plant is dead at four. This one goes way down to 12. And this one has a record for a flowering plant. And what's amazing, if you're looking at chaparral, these are all chaparral shrubs. They're all growing side by side. They're co-dominant. Should they all be examined the same? And are they all going to respond to climate change in the same way? Are they going to respond to drought in the same way? I'm going to argue this one, acute drought. This one, chronic drought. And by totally different mechanisms. That helps us understand and understand and predict what might happen. So I'm going to show you some data here. This is acute drought. This picture was taken in February, the wettest month of the year normally. You can see there are 11 species here. They're not doing too well. Here's riparian in the background. Here's our Cenotha species, maybe cuneatus and Cenotha spinosus. In the background, you can't quite see it, but that's our melasma lorina. And what we did is we took data on these plants, and the question is, 11 species, which species is going to fare the best? Which species are going to persist? Which ones are going to handle this acute drought? Is it going to be the Cienothus megacarpus that's very resistant to dehydration? Or is it going to be Melasma rhina that's very susceptible to dehydration, but it has a deep root? And the way you take that data is you go out and you count the number of dead individuals versus those that are alive. So here's our mortality. You can see this is like 90% mortality, 8% mortality, 72% mortality, 60%. And all of these species are shallow rooted, very resistant to cavitation and embolism. They're not very vulnerable. This is your Cenothus spinosus, Cenothus cuneatus, Archistaphus marca. Um, I know Michelle Slayton. What's she talking about your presentation? Yeah, this is good. <laughs> you know you know her. Okay. So my question is, where is Melasma lorina on this figure right here? On the left or on the right? Melasma lorina. Can you guess? There's Melasma lorina. So it, in, as far as acute drought, it does incredibly well. Why is it doing so well? Can anybody tell me at this site? 11 species all together. Melasma rhina does great, the others don't. Why is Melasma rhina doing so well with acute drought? Can anybody tell me? Deep roots. Deep roots. And the deep roots trump everything. And I assume, well, at least we're going to have Melasma rhina during the drought in California. It's invincible. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's never going to die. 100% restrap success after fire. So here's some data just to show that uh, that was due to cavitation and embolism. This is water potential. I'm going from zero, have to go all the way down to negative 14. And we see that if we measure that on these 11 species, this water potential of very low values predicts adult mortality. So it shows it's due to dehydration that's causing it. If you do um, fluorescence, that's just a measure of the health of the chloroplast in the leaves. Eight is healthy, 0.1 is almost non-functional chloroplast. It also predicts mortality. But the most important one is this one here. This is hydraulic flow through the stem. It's called 
paid the best, and you just measure the flow rate through the stem, if there's blockage, if there's bubbles that's blocking the water flow, this is going to go very low. So here we have no blockage, just a little bit of blockage. And now we have high blockage, 0.1, and that predicts our adult mortality. So the evidence is this is caused by cavitation and embolism due to severe dehydration, which is shown right here. Okay, so now I'm going to switch over to chronic drought. And here's our immortal, here's our invincible, here's our deep-rooted shrub that goes down 40 feet in depth. And I thought, well, at least we're going to have a lot more rain. Okay? This is what our campus looked like in 1985. This is what it looked like about two months ago. Do you see any differences here? Okay, exclude this campus. We built a campus, right? <laughs> so there's the ocean. There's Point Dune. It's exactly the same view. And notice some species have dropped out. But we still have Melasma lorina. Okay? It's still there. So what's interesting is um, this plant, see, you know, this carpus, dropped out because of high fire frequency. It's a non sprouter after fire. It only comes back by seed germination. And if the fires come too soon, it's eliminated. So that's what caused this to drop out of our system. This one dropped out due to the drought of 2002, clearance data, the drought of 2007, and now the drought of 2012 to 16. So this one has dropped out almost, that's where the spaces are. But here's our invincible one, Melasma lorina, and the problem is it now has a problem. I know you can't see this from the back of the room, but if you, you're up here where I am, about right here, you can see it. I can barely see it because I know what it is. But uh, they got a little brown leaves off here. There's a problem. Just about two months ago, they showed up with a massive fungal infection. And I'm afraid these plants are going to start looking like those right there. You see, you see right there where I'm pointing? If you go low elevation, there's less rainfall. There's drier. And this is what it looks like. So these plants are going to become like those that you look like. Because the infection is now gone even to this high elevation where there's high rainfall. So let me show you the data that supports this interpretation. The question was, what causes dieback in Melasma rhina? Was it water stress-induced air blockage of xylem and cavitation? Or is it solid blockage due to this fungus? Here's a healthy. Here's our one in the process of dieback. You can see the tips dying. So what we did is we took the stem. We did a cross-section of the stem. We looked at it in the microscope, and we did this remarkable thing. It's called double staining. We ran a stain through to see what pipes were working. Then we blew out the air bubbles, and we took a different stain, a blue one, and we ran it through again to show what was embolized. And then we compared a healthy plant over here to our dieback plant. This one had no fungi growing on petri dishes, uh, on the uh, nutrient auger. This one had fungi growing in it. It's every time it works out. Okay? So what happens is, initially, you notice it's almost all stain. There's only 3% blockage, a little bit of white here and there. This is piss, so that doesn't count. Over here, massive amount of solid physical blockage due to the fungus in response to it. We do have uh, red and blue. The blue indicates percent embolism, so we can calculate that. The percent embolism here is 40%. The percent embolism here is 40%. So it's not cavitation and embolism and air bubble blockage. It's a solid so it suggests this probably is. So we set up these hypotheses. What caused the observed dieback in chronic drought? Is possibly predisposing a melasma rhina to fungal infection that spreads. That is, it's so weakened, it doesn't produce enough carbon. It can't wall it off and the fungus starts to grow. In addition, it can't transport the carbon to that site to wall it off. Okay. Number two, we use Koch's postulate to elucidate the fungal cause of the disease. Every time we saw the disease, what grew? We inoculated the healthy plant, it got sick. We re-isolated them, and it should have been the same pathogen, which is called toxin. Number three, if we use water starvation and carbon starvation in controlled pot experiments, it should indicate impact on fungal growth and invasion. So we tested that concept. Thirdly, we asked this question, is the dehydration tolerance of the pathogen 
exceeding the dehydration survival limits of the host. What's amazing is we know Unambiguously, when this plant is out, you start to dehydrate, it gets the negative four megapascals, it will go on to the question. What about the fungus swimming? If the fungus can withstand that kind of dehydration and exceed it, that fungus can drive this plant to death. And so we tested that hypothesis with living tissue in test tubes. And here's uh, Natalie Ure, who did uh, almost all of this work that I'm going to show you. Okay, I'm sorry this, you can't see this very well. Just take my word, they're numbers here and they match these numbers here. This is a map of the Santa Monica Mountains. It shows the hydrology and precipitation. We picked 10 sites, high elevation, high rainfall, typically 18 to 20 inches, and 10 matching sites, very low elevation, low of rainfall, about 12 to 13 inches. And we compared these sites. And what we did is we just scored the plants. We measured 30 to 90 plants. If it looked like this, it was dead. We gave it a zero. If it looked like this, glorious, you can't even see the person, all you see are the legs, right? We gave that a five. So the question is, how does that distribute in this map? High rainfall, low rainfall, this is our plant bigger score, and notice, high rainfall, typically threes up to fives, the dieback, less than one. So it suggests the drier sites are having the major problem. One exception is right here at two, but notice there's a dry finger. I can see that there's a dry finger even at high elevation. So this is Robert Taylor's map. Very, very valuable. So if we look at plant mortality, the mortality here is typically close to zero, except for that dry finger. Down here, the dieback is between 12 and 52 percent. By the way, this is our campus now, and it's at 64 percent. It keeps more and more keep dying. Okay, plant fitness, this is flowering time, uh, the, uh, whether flowers or not, and this one, uh, dieback has few flowers, where the control has a lot of flowers, suggesting uh, that this is impacting uh, flowering time also, flower, uh, percent flowering also. Okay, we tested the acute drought versus the chronic drought in a chamber experiment. And in the field experiment, this one only lasted about one month. This one lasted about three months. And when we did it in the chamber, there was not much impact on fungal elongation in the tissue. The control was not significantly different than the water stress. But if we went chronic with it, we, had, we saw uh, that this was a major problem for melasma lorina. Uh, water stress had much higher fungal elongation rates than the control uh, that was irrigated. And so it shows the chronic scenario is, is the challenging one. Okay, we looked at uh, Koch's uh, postulate, and uh, we did this typically in the field. The tip dies first, and then there's a canker. I know you can't see it, but trust me, there's a canker right there, and it's green below, and dead above. This is the most typical pattern. So what we did is we aseptically uh, took xylem tissue out, and we saw fungus 100% of the time, 90, uh, the xylem, 95% in the phloem, above 85% distal, below 45%, notice the green leaves, re-sprouts 45%, and then the control, we never found um, any of the fungi in the controls, and we did this for 20 different individuals in every case. So uh, we hypothesized that the fungal pathogen would reduce the water flow rate through the stem. That's the case of S. We measure the flow through the stem, and we did that for the same specimens. Proximal, there's some flow, case of S, but the canker, almost no flow, and distal, almost no flow, suggesting it's really water occlusion, the blocking of water flow that's causing this. As far as Koch's postulate, uh, we use a genetic uh, primers, and we use internal transcription spacer, a bit beta tabulin 2 gene and the elongation factor 1 alpha, and there was greater than a 99% match to a fungus known as Botryosphyria diphthidia, which has been described universal in the chaparral shrub, except it hasn't been described in the lobster until uh, just two weeks ago. It was in, uh, published in plant disease. Okay, um, hypothesis three was both water starvation and carbon starvation will enhance fungal growth rates 
and the way we did this, we uh, water starved the plants by not watering them. non -irrigated. This one, we carbon starved the plant by ripping the leaves off. Terrible thing to do. But, okay. And so we inoculated the fungus into the stem. And when we didn't irrigate, we saw the water potential went down. Remember this number, negative four? That's where the plant gets in jeopardy, melasma orina. This is what it looks like in the field. This is what it looks like in our control plant experiment. And so we're down below the turtle loss point. We're down where cavitation embolized. We, we did all of those uh, measurements. So our experiment worked. Then what we did uh, is we measured the growth rate of the fungus. I know you can't see this, but there's a little bit of black here, a little bit of black down there. We just measured that length, and that's the elongation length in millimeters per week. That's the growth rate. The irrigated uh, was low, carbon starved was intermediate, and the water starved was high. If you subtract this one from that one, that's due to the water ability to transport the carbon. This is just uh, due to carbon starvation. So it all worked in the direction you would predict for fungi. In this case, does the dehydration tolerance of the fungus to see that of the host? Here's our little numbers, negative one down to negative four, where the host dies, and we see, uh-oh, the fungus can still grow. So it shows the fungus can grow at those water potentials and kill the host. So in conclusion, uh, we suggest that dieback is not caused by water stress-induced air blockage, but solid blockage of the xylem conduits, uh, fungal-induced. The ultimate cause of dieback is chronic drought, but the proximate is this fungus. Both water starvation and carbon starvation enhance fungal growth, and the dehydration tolerance of the fungus exceeds that of the host. So as far as recommendations, um, if you want to save these plants, you probably have to move the seeds uphill because there's more precipitation uphill. And because of the climate change, there's warmer nights and this plant can't handle freezing. So uh, higher elevation um, and that's becoming uh, more promising with uh, climate change. Okay, any questions about uh, the presentation? This is uh, funded by NSF. And also, these are my students. These are all undergrad students in my plant physiology classes. So thank you for your attention.